uh, we're going to be talking about diagnosing and predicting problems with rod pumps. So, everybody I think knows what a rod pump is. Um, we see very beautiful photographs uh, of them in the desert with the setting sun behind them, so we all know what we're talking about. Um, the horse head moves up and down, meaning that the rod moves up and down, and there's a traveling valve attached to the bottom of the rod. At the bottom of the well, there's a standing well valve, and between the two of them, it basically is a sucking motion, drawing the oil from the bottom of the well to the surface. Um, on the right hand side of the image, you see a sort of you know, time lapse diagram of what this does. It is when, it, when the traveling valve moves down, it opens, lets the oil pass through. At the bottom of the stroke, the traveling valve closes, at which point the standing valve on the bottom opens up, the traveling valve moves up, thereby sucking up the oil that was there before, and the standing valve lets new oil come into the well, and the whole thing repeats. Now, it was discovered in the 1930s that if you measure both the load, so the weight of the oil on the traveling valve as it moves, as well as the displacement of where the traveling valve is located during the stroke against each other, you get a so-called dynamometer card. That's what you see at the bottom right here. The load on the vertical axis and this displacement of the horizontal axis gets you this picture. Now, uh, theoretically speaking, this looks roughly like a rectangle, like you see on this diagram. And if we uh, move to an actual picture, it looks like this in, in real life, uh, when we take a measurement of what these uh, data actually look like. And you can see that the rectangle has these four uh, points on them, and that is basically these traveling and standing valves opening and closing. Now, it was also discovered uh, in the 1930s that you can look at this diagram visually uh, as a human expert and diagnose what is wrong with the rod pump, and indeed if there is anything wrong with the rod pump. The more like a rectangle this picture looks, uh, the more normal the pump is, and the more dented that rectangle is, and the more something is wrong with it. And depending on where the dents are and exactly how it looks like, you can diagnose what exactly is wrong with it. So we have um, a number of educated experts throughout the world in every oil field, every upstream uh, oil and gas company that specialize in looking at these diagrams and diagnosing what's wrong with the rod pump and then uh, scheduling the appropriate maintenance activity. And these experts spend most of their time looking at these diagrams and coming up with the proper diagnosis. Now, you might imagine that this takes a rather long time. Not only that, an expert cannot look at all the diagrams that are out there because even one rod pump might stroke three or four times per minute. So the number of dynamometer cards being produced by these pumps is enormous. Uh, case in point, in the oil field right here in Bahrain, there are about 750 of these pumps. And so we are talking about uh, several thousand diagrams being produced um, every day. And that cannot be looked at by all the people that are available to look at them. So we ask ourselves, can we automate this? Um, here is a picture um, of various dynamometer cars and their various uh, damage mechanisms. So you can see that for a human being, if we know what we're doing, it is a rather easy diagnosis. So you might imagine that you can teach a computer how to do this diagnosis uh, without needing a human expert. Now, one of the elements of machine learning is that we need to present training data, teacher data, to the computer. That is to say, we need to present a set of dynamometer cards along with the annotation of which damage mechanism is currently present. So we need to get some human experts to take a bunch of these cards and label them appropriately. And then this collection can be provided to the learning algorithm to then provide the model. So that we don't overfit or underfit the data, there's usually um, a nice process called feature engineering or dimensionality reduction uh, to get from the raw data of the card to something that is meaningfully presented to that learning algorithm. 
Um, in this case, um, every dynamometer card is made up of 100 points. Every point, of course, has two dimensions, the load and the displacement, so we're talking about 200 numerical values making up a single diagram. That's uh, rather many input variables for um, a realistic amount of labeled data, so we need to reduce the amount of data. Um, so we went through a study of feature engineering, um, and you can read the, the paper for the details of this, um, but there have been a number of suggestions in the historical literature over the last few decades on how to do this. Uh, we've uh, checked all of them out, and I'll just give you the punchline. Uh, the final answer is that you want to be representing a card as a Fourier series, um, as the process is inherently periodic, you're allowed to do that. Fourier series represents a periodic curve, and you cut that off at the first of the Fourier moments. Um, again, details are in the paper. And that combined with the centroid, and the location uh, of where that card is in load and displacement space, gives you all the information that you need. So the 200 numerical values that we started off with are now compressed to just five numerical values that characterize a card sufficiently accurately in order to come to the conclusion of what damage mechanism it is. So we measure the card um, in reality, then we turn that by dimensionality reduction into this five-dimensional space that we've constructed by the Fourier analysis, and then we compute using the uh, computerized algorithm what uh, damage mechanism is present, and then we can notify somebody of that. And here is the result um, of our preliminary study on this. Um, so a number of cards were measured right here in the Bahrain model field, and were classified by domain experts right here as well. And we've divided up uh, the amount of data that we've had into 75% and used for the training of the algorithm and the other 25 to test the result. And we've had about 35,000 of these diagrams that were manually labeled available. So thank you very much to the uh, hard-working engineers of Tatweer for doing all this work. Labeling 35,000 diagrams is a lot of work. So hats off to you. And they were distributed in the categories that you see here, which are examples of damage mechanisms. The list could be longer, but it's a, these are the main damage mechanisms that occur in practice. And you see how many training examples and testing examples we've had, and you can see that from 35,000 examples, we're making seven errors. Um, so that amounts to a 99.9% .9 accuracy rating, um, which in the end is a higher accuracy than you would expect from a human being classifying uh, the data on an ongoing basis. So the advantage that you can immediately see is the accuracy is higher and than what you would get from the domain expert. And of course, this <coughs> results in automation. The decision that is being made by the human expert is now being made by a computer, freeing up the human expert to do other things that require this intelligence and his domain knowledge more. In other words, scheduling the actual maintenance activity. And then we get questions like which spare parts do we need? Which crew shall we send out in order to affect that maintenance repair? These are decisions that really need the domain expert. This stuff we cannot make. There's a further advantage, of course, because these dynamometer <coughs> cards are being collected at three or four cards a minute per pump. The automation of this allows us to diagnose every single one of them. The thing that, of course, for the human domain expert is an absolute impossibility. You could not go through a couple thousand images every few minutes, and the computer can. So we get a whole bunch of advantages like this. And um, Ted Weir has uh, graciously uh, agreed to say a few words about the value of this in the practical application in the field. Hi, uh, my name is Sage Sharaf. Uh, I'm a data scientist at that way. So, um, as you can see here, um, we took this example of one well that is produced in 
approximately 50 barrels per day. And using the software, uh, we detected the issue. Uh, however, um, we kept it. Uh, the details of the issue was not uh, informed to the uh, experts. And what we noticed is that um, they took approximately nine days to, uh, to detect the issue and fix it. Um, if we calculate the, the last uh, nine days, we have over 150 barrels, um, approximately over $20,000. So, so the value of this is we want to reduce um, this amount to the least. So immediately if there's an issue, um, the software will be able to detect the issue, inform um, responsible people to take the action immediately. This shows a real-time map that we had built uh, based on the data collected from the OPC server. So um, this shows that in real time we can monitor all of the wells and diagnose all the conditions that are occurring in real time. Thank you. So you can see part of the advantage of the automation here is that compared to the human domain expert who detects that something only after the effect most of the time simply because of the sheer amount of cards to look at, here we've been able to detect uh, the problem nine days earlier than a human being would have detected it. Nine days earlier, meaning a certain production of oil, uh, so the actual uh, financial advantage of the automation is quite significant. Um, so that's something that's been uh, developed right here in the oil field in Bahrain, and it's a new technology that we hope to uh, roll out. So you can find more details in, in the paper. Thank you very much.